This past Monday night, we had David and Caron Loveless, who have been dear friends and leaders from Florida. Um, many of you guys know that David had a moral failure a number of years ago that came to light last year, caused him to step down from pastoring, uh, and really has gone through an incredibly challenging and then restorative time, and recently a recommissioning time of being able to, in some way, minister. He's not pastoring that church, but he came and then shared his testimony last Monday night. And being his best friend in ministry, I was involved in that from the very inception, and then almost day after day for months calling, uh, visiting with him at times, but seeing the restorative work in his life. And so I want to say to you, I know that there are relational challenges in this room, um, and actually there's actually a group that has just started upstairs called Love and War. Uh, about a helping marriages. And so there are couples up there right now. But uh, if you perhaps uh, have an area of relational disconnect with your spouse, then as of Tuesday, what David and Caron shared when Susie and I interviewed them with about 150 people in this room last Monday night, that will be online. And you can uh, look at that. It will help you. Uh, it is one of the most beautiful restorative experiences I've ever had. Um, I uh, was an evangelist for 18 years, and so I was kind of Uncle Francis that when something weird happened, churches would call me in uh, to help when a leader fell. And uh, went through some very, very sad occasions, um, as of course this was very sad, but I didn't always see that restorative process that I would love to see. Uh, and David and Caron had that. Uh, really, God provided, because they're going to be used by God to help many people. While with them this week, um, they had texts from CEOs of major corporations who said, uh, I'm in trouble. I need to get together with you. And then another pastor contacted uh, I have a need. We need to get together. So they're going to be used by God as a special kind of SWAT team, if you will, uh, going in and helping couples. Uh, believe me, they don't want to spend the rest of their lives doing that. They'll do other things besides that, but they will be doing that in addition. And so David mentioned this, uh, this verse this week in John 6, 12. He said, uh, speaking of the loaves and the fishes and picking up the fragments and broken pieces, Jesus said, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. How many of you have been a leftover fragment? Okay. How many felt like your life was fragmented and uh, you felt, you know, you were lost and all of a sudden uh, Jesus gathered you up. And so I feel that. You know, Jesus said the good shepherd uh, leaves the 99 and goes after the one. We should always be in our heart thinking, who is that one that is hurt? And I think about that often. I spoke last week on shame, and I got to speak that in the 9 o'clock service. If you missed that, it's online. It's great. Brian spoke on Saturday night. And then at 11 o'clock, uh, as we allow God, we say, Lord, we're here for you. Do what you want. Well, he broke out at 11 o'clock, and we just had an extended time of worship, and then a time of the body ministering over the body, praying for one another, an exceptional time. But uh, if you battle with shame, as I see, I see people come in, and it's uh, kind of like the, they're coming to a Chinese restaurant. They drag on in, and uh, they're, 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 they're not experiencing the joy and the life that they should. They, they feel the shame. They're ashamed. And Jesus, the Bible says, uh, despise the shame. And, and he wants us to despise shame. Shame, God does not want to put shame on anybody. Uh, shame is like condemnation. It's fatalistic. It's, it's condemning. Whereas guilt is a temporary thing. We feel guilt. We do something wrong. We should. We feel bad. We ask forgiveness of God, of others. But then it's followed by forgiveness and healing. Uh, none of us as parents ever want to make our kids wallow in uh, feeling bad. We want them to acknowledge if they've done something wrong, as we should, and model that for them. But then beyond that, uh, whenever we uh, asked our children to what they did wrong, and they would acknowledge it, whatever discipline took place, then we would love them, pray with them, sing with them, and then it was never discussed again. It was move, We moved on past that, and that created a very healthy bond that has lasted decades now. But I think of the struggles that Christians go through, and C.S. Lewis is just a profound man who wrote a number of books 
books that have inspired me. One of them is Screw Tape Letters. And he speaks in the book about wearing down Christians. And in it, an older demon, it's a fiction book, but it speaks about biblical principles. An older demon is talking to a younger demon, really how Christians uh, struggle. And he says this, it's so hard for these creatures to persevere. The routine of adversity, the gradual decay of youthful loves and youthful hopes, the quiet despair of ever overcoming the chronic temptations with which we have again and again defeated them. And so once we understand there's an enemy to our soul, he's a real deal. And he is constantly attacking us, and he can beat us down, wearing us down with discouragement. That's why we need the Word of God to wash our hearts and minds. This morning on a bike ride, I'm in the Psalms. Whenever I'm kind of going through it, I'll just be candid. Not that I'm going through it, but I'm, I'm really needing to believe God. And this message uh, and this season is a, is a bit challenging. I just wash myself with the Word of God. And I just let the Word of God, and Psalms in particular, if I'm really going through it, I'll go through Job. Or if I'm out of work, I'll look for, read Job. The book of Job is also a blessing. But um, to be able to allow God spirit to wash over you, to encourage you. That's what God wants to do. Now, Jesus said in the last days, he said this, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most, the love of many will grow cold. Uh, again, last days have lasted a while now. But I, th I think we can all see, especially in the low tides of pre-revival, when a revival has not happened for decades in a nation, in those low tides, it gets hard for people at times in waiting. You know, it's like the tide's out. You see styrofoam cups and tires and boots in the mud, and you're waiting for the refreshing of God's spirit. You're waiting for the fresh wave of God to come. And so the challenge is that our love can grow cold. Our hearts can get cold. We can begin to feel like nothing's going on. And yet, ironically, it's the great greatest opportunities around the band. I remember working as a, uh, just when I, as a brand new Christian, needed some extra money, I worked as a night watchman in a furniture store in Yuba City, and uh, out there in the middle of the night, the furniture's all outside, you got to watch it, and I'm there, and you know, initially I'm doing good, I'm reading the word, I'm listening to music, I'm walking around, but about four o'clock in the morning, I'm like, oh God, and I don't want to mess up, I don't want to be a bad steward on the job, and so I I'm trying to keep myself awake, and oftentimes it feels that way to stay spiritually alive, you know, because ironically, the, the sun was coming up. The, the hardest moment was the darkest hour, that moment when just pre-light, I was struggling, waiting for the sun to come over the hill to kind of give me a fresh breath of encouragement. And, and that's what God wants us to do, to know that. So what could be so sad in our lives? Here's a, uh, a, uh, a slide of what our, my message is, losing your faith. And I've been thinking about that. What would cause people to lose heart, to lose hope, to lose our faith? You know, I could ask you this question interactively. I'm not. I'm just going to ask you to think about it. Uh, are, are you as much filled with faith now for your future and the future of our church, our city, our nation as you have ever been? Are you as much filled with faith or has your faith waned? You know, that's an important question. Has God lost faith? Is God pacing heaven going, I know, I know. I see what's going on. It's driving me crazy too. Or is God filled with faith? Is he peaking with faith for this moment? And are those who are going to really be in, in, involved in experiencing all God has at this moment, needing to fill our hearts with faith? And so, again, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad. I'm trying to make you to acknowledge, is there an issue right now of losing faith where you need to be encouraged and increase in faith, which I believe is appropriate at this moment? So what could be so sad that could push us away and cause us to lose our faith? You know, is there, is there is really one deadly sin uh, that is responsible, I believe, for people to lose their faith? One of the ones in the Bible. Uh, and uh, when Jesus mentioned the Lord's Prayer, uh, he spoke of it twice. The only thing he said twice in the Lord's Prayer alludes to what causes the leak in our heart, the drainage of losing our faith. And that has a, a word called forgiveness. He said that we should forgive. The sin of forgive, unforgiveness, I believe, is the most common wrong in the world. Unforgiveness, 
uh, is the Ebola of our age. It is the thing that keeps us potentially from living the abundant life God wants us. So that, that root cause of that, of that disharmony uh, in our lives, uh, the Bible says the root of that unforgiveness is a word called bitterness. Bitterness is what causes unforgiveness to come in our hearts. Um, there's a verse here in Proverbs. The heart knows its own bitterness. Every one of us, you know, I look back on my own life. I was bitter toward my dad. The day he died, I was glad he died. Sad, tragic event. I was so angry at him not being there for me, abandoned, rejected, not being around him. And um, it took me a long time. Uh, he, it would be seven more years before I became a Christian after he died. I'm sorry, it would be six more years. Uh, 17 he died, I got saved at 23. And, um, and then even as a Christian, I couldn't call God Father for two years. I referred to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but this dad thing was off my grid. Uh, even when I, uh, my wife was going to have a baby, uh, I was terrified. I didn't have any idea what it would like to be a dad. And I, I began to look for people who knows how to be a dad. And candidly, I saw some of the Christian kids I was around. I didn't really want them. So I was thinking... We, we have enough brats on the planet. We don't really need more. So then I, we found a, a family that had four children, and they were clear-eyed and great attitudes, and they became fast friends. We took them out for lunch that day. Uh, they were in the armed forces. We went to visit them in Germany and Omaha, Nebraska. They helped us to understand how to raise kids, even at that early age. But bitterness uh, choked out my early years. Uh, and no one really knows your bitterness. We can share it. Uh, but no one really knows your joy. My joy is my joy, but my bitterness is my bitterness as well. And so uh, a huge part of that bitterness in our lives can contaminate us and make us not forgive people. Uh, in the Bible, Peter saw Simon the sorcerer, and he said, I perceive, had a word of knowledge, I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Bitterness will cause you to do some horrible things. Bitterness will cause you to treat people poorly, reject people, push them away, mock them, belittle them, um, want to hurt them. You know, hate produces hurt sometimes, or vice versa. And hurt produces hate. So those things are, are not good. And so hurt people hurt people, but healed people heal people. And God wants us to be healed in our lives. Uh, what, I am, what I love and the thing that sets me free and did set me free from bitterness is a great word called grace. Grace is a marvelous word. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It is kindness from God we don't deserve. There's nothing we have done or can ever do to earn his favor. It's a gift from God. If you offered someone giving you a gift money, it would be an insult. We can't earn it. We can't deserve the grace of God. It's a free gift given to us by the God of the universe who died in our place, took our punishment, took our sin upon himself, a Mount Everest of sin piled on him, and then became that substitute for us. And consequently, he offers us the free gift of forgiveness, the free gift of everlasting life. Grace is the divine assistance given to humans for their rebirth, being born again. And sanctification. You know, there's a lot of definitions on sanctification. I, I like this definition, becoming holy. Not that we can strut our stuff and, man, I'm holy. You know, that's not the attitude that's, you know, you're not holy at that moment. If you're thinking you're holy, you're not. But there, there's a getting close to God where as you're in his presence and you're not thinking about what you're not, you're thinking about who he is and what he's done in your life, all of a sudden there's a holiness that comes on you. There's a, a grace that's on you that enables you. And it, as Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. You know, God the Father said to be holy as I am holy. So grace is our get out of hell free card, okay? It is that it's not cheap. It costs Jesus his life, but it enables us to not experience the punishment we deserve. None of us want God to be fair with us. None of us are saying, God, give me what I deserve. No, 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 no. You do not want God to give you what you deserve. No, no. You want God to give you mercy. You want God to give you what you don't deserve. You want God to, to give his son what you deserve, which he did. And he, he killed him for you, for me. But he wants to give us. And this is where 
This is where the love comes from. Why are people so in love with God? Why are they in love with Jesus? Because if someone took a bullet for you, if someone drowned in your place, if they gave their life for you, you would appreciate them. Well, not only did they give, did he give his life for us, but he took our, our punishment. The things we did wrong, he took the, the bullet for us. And that's what when you are born again, when you see it and your eyes are open and the veil is lifted and you see what Jesus did, then you will spend your life never forgetting and being grateful every day, every day for what Jesus did in my life. I am grateful. Now, is it possible to miss out on the grace of God? Yeah, that's the sad thing. It's a free gift that some people never open. It's a lottery ticket that's never cashed in. And so that's why Hebrews says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Uh, there, that there is no, next slide there, that there is no root of bitterness springing up and causing trouble, and by it many be defiled. You say it's my issue. There's almost nothing that is just your issue. <laughs> You know, if you have something that stinks in your refrigerator, uh, it makes everything potentially over time stink. And so if there's stink in my life, it affects people around me. I'm just saying. So I have to recognize, you know, I, I've been around people that have been angry. And the Bible says, don't hang around angry people, lest you be like them. Something happens. Something is passed on to us. We learn their habits, their attitude. I mean, some of you work in work environments. You know, you work, you got boss. I remember having this boss um, when I, again, new Christian, 1974. We planted a church in Lake Tahoe. I got a job cleaning the gourmet kitchen in the Sahara Casino there. And my boss was this, you know, you know this, is, he, this is my introduction to my job. This is your blankety-blank job. If you don't blankety-blank want to do it, we'll get blankety-blank someone else. Thank you. Give me a hug. Okay, it was, just, it was just that bonding moment we had together that was just so special. So bitterness was in his heart. He was from New York, and I just for a moment had, I, say, I'm, I tr thought I'd build a bridge. I'm from New York, too. And he goes, yes, yeah, like living in the bottom of a garbage pail. Okay, that was it. No bonding about New York. So that was my introduction to him. So I didn't want to hang around him, as you might imagine. He was an angry guy. He didn't want to hang around me either, but I, we didn't go out, you know, uh, to uh, fellowship together later on, uh, and he wasn't around. But another guy who was very angry, I did get to encourage and minister to, and he was very touched by the Lord over time. But who wants to flunk being forgiven? You know, who, who wants to fail to obtain the grace of God? You know, who wants to walk around uh, like a plague looking for a place to happen? Who, who wants to have a chip on your shoulder that makes you act like a chump? I mean, none of us want this. I don't want to fail to obtain the grace of God. And so in order to not be bitter, then that word that Jesus said twice in his Lord's Prayer, forgiveness has to become a part of my life, where I release others and I forgive them and no longer, like Jesus did, hold them responsible for their sin. So what's an offense? Offenses come when we don't forgive people. When we uh, refuse to forgive them, we become offended. What's an offense? Something that constitutes a violation of what is judged to be right. It is caused by an annoyance or resentment brought about by a perceived insult to or disregard for one's standards or principle. I can't believe they did that to me. I was bitter toward my father. He offended me. He put me to boarding school at 11, never visited a school I attended, and just dropped me off there. And it made me angry. It made me hate him. And uh, not made me, because that's my responsibility, my deal. But it, pr it produced an offense in my heart. Now I love my dad. I would love, he's been dead for 48 years, but I would love to see him again. I hope as, as my mother's prayers reached me, my mom's prayers reached him, and that when I get to heaven, the first person, aside from Jesus, I want to see is my dad. I would love my dad to be there. My heart's been forgiven. My heart's been healed. That's what God can do in our hearts. But a perceived insult... You know, there are people, we call it going postal. It's a sad expression, but where someone loses it, gets a rifle, and starts killing people. 
And then oftentimes they kill themselves because they realize what they've done. Like Judas, they, they realize they're angry. They expected Jesus to do something. He didn't do it. Offenses lead to betrayal. Again, if you kill your whole family, that's betrayal, folks. He betrayed Jesus, and then he took his own life. So let me ask you a question. Do you presently, take out your interactives, those who have uh, phones, you can grab those today. Uh, go to the Rock app, if you would, and um, then you can go right online. But if you don't have the Rock app, go to Messages uh, and do a new message and type in 22333 right there and then begin to vote. Uh, if you have the Rock app, go to Live, then Interactive Question, and would you um, vote now? And we have the votes coming in. Uh, okay, so if people are grabbing their phones around the room, people in North Korea right now are voting. It's an incredible through the miracle of the internet and technology. Well, someone, there is someone. I was wondering when someone would show up for one. So it's looking like a horse race. Well, it's increasing now. Um, but we have about half of us are in one and two, where there is some offenses going on. Still about half going on in one and two. Uh, pretty much the other half used to, but not anymore. And then we have a few folks have never had uh, an offense, which is amazing. Uh, and may that continue. All right, so we see it's a horse race, okay? About, you know, simple terms, about half of us presently are battling with some kind of an offense. The other half presently are aware of that used to, but not at this present moment. I'm just trying to say that they're a real deal in our lives. And uh, the sad thing, though, is to refuse to forgive. You know, it took me a long time to get fully healed. I've not had a bad thought about my dad in six years. Not a bad thought. Again, that's a good thing. Now, did I release him? I released him thousands of times. He had done nothing new. I just rehearsed the old stuff, the old words that were said. You know, my sister said to me a few years ago after I'd been healed, she said, do you remember when dad called you a thief and, and a liar? Do you remember when he said that? No, I don't remember that. And a bum, I'm sorry, that was the other word. And a bum. No, I don't remember that. Well, I don't want to remember that either, okay? So let's, let's not talk about that right now. Let's move on. I'm having good thoughts about dad right now, so let's leave that alone. <laughs> Bitterness can make us mad, but offense can make us sad um, and even bring us to despair. Cause of illness, Atlanta Center for Disease Control once said that 87% of sickness originates from stress. Uh, now it's probably 97 plus percent. If what you have is not from a genetic damage or some kind of deadly viral attack like Ebola, your disease is likely intimately tied to stress and depression. We often have depression sometimes from unforgiveness from a lack of ability to get over an offense in our lives. And offenses uh, ultimately cause us to have an offense towards someone when they do something we didn't expect. We had an unfulfilled expectation. I believe an expectation by its very nature is a disappointment waiting to happen. I don't want to have any expectations other than I trust God that what God allows and brings in my life is going to work for my good. So I, I'm not leaning into, I expect this to happen today. I expect God to do this. I have done that. I have lived that way. And it brought a lot of pain in my life. What I'm expecting is, like Psalm 62, verse 5, my soul wait only upon God, for my expectation is from him. And then not only am I waiting for him to move, I am trusting that how he moves will work for my good and make me the person that I want to be and need to be. Now, someone offended is not usually full of hate, but is often left wrestling with some once desired good that has failed to come in the way, time, or the place they wanted it to. Some of you are not just offended with People on earth, you're offended with God. I can't believe God did that. I wrote a book that talked about that initial offense called Perfectly Positioned, uh, talking about things that I was believing for, that God had done the greatest miracles in my life took place in projects that he never intended to complete. And so I hit brick walls at 80 miles an hour and didn't understand that I was the project. 
and that that event, though it seemed hurtsome, was producing in me, getting my eyes off what I could do for God and receiving what he had already done for me and basking in that. So every day, uh, I'm the project, and God's going to complete the project today. He's going to complete his work in me. He who has begun a good work in you shall bring it to completion. I'm believing he's going to, it's God that's working in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So I'm excited about Christ in me, the only hope of glorifying God. And so um, something happens that you say, I can't believe God allowed that. And it can be tragic. You know, at some point, all of us will experience something that at that moment just is the most tragic, heart-rending thing, the loss of a loved one, the, the loss of a home, a job, a, a loss of your health. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can happen, that sense of loss. And if, at that point, we can lose our faith. We can lose our confidence that there's a good God in heaven who's going to make that, that hurts so much at this moment, work together for our good. When Susie lost her husband, um, in a plane wreck, and her parents said they were separated. He was going to file for divorce on that day. He was a crop duster, and he died in a plane accident. And they showed up at her uh, room. With, uh, she was living with other ladies and uh, showed up there in our Christian community at midnight and knocked on the door and got her out of bed. And, and uh, they said that he's dead. Dennis is dead. He died today. And uh, she was heartbroken, and she went back, began to pack her things, and then looked on the wall of her little room there, and there was a verse, Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for the good, for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. And she read it, and it's a life verse right now. She said, God, this, this is a bummer day. It's going to be a good day. It's got to be a good day up ahead. And she got me, hallelujah. Okay, it's a little joke there. Anyway. <laughs> it's sick humor. That's all right. <laughs> Often she's glad. Anyway, so Friday, Susie and I were with David and Corona. All of a sudden, we get a text. People are calling us. Our phones are going off the hook that our grandson, Grayson, Havila's son, um, has climbed out and fallen out of a second story window in their home and landed on a wooden deck, three years old. So that's what we see this picture. Our hearts obviously sink. We're calling my brothers, two brothers, my sister. People are contacting me and everything's blowing up. What's going on? And so uh, we obviously call them. Um, they're in the hospital, they're examining him, and, you know, by the grace and mercy of God, he's okay. You know, he had a cut lip and everything, that was him that day. Now, um, just go back, go back just to that picture. At one point, all I had was that, and I have a decision to make. Yes, I'm going to be praying, of course. I'm praying for God, would you please, Lord? But I'm already preparing my heart for whatever may happen. You know, the deal is, guys, uh, I'm not God. I don't know what's best for me. I don't even know what's best for my kids or grandkids. Meaning, meaning that if all things are going to work together for the good, all of us can look back at moments. And talking to Dave and Corona, even though it was the most horrible experience of their life, and knowing them for almost 30 years, they have never done better. They, they, are, they are never. Matter of fact, David said he was talking to some pastor who knew him before. And he was talking about a month ago. And he goes, I feel, this pastor said to David, I feel much safer around you now than I did a couple, three years ago. You're a different guy. You're a different person. So, again, I'm not wishing anyone ill. And again, if I was God, like in the Bruce Almighty movie, and I would, yes, yes, I make, you know, everything is yes. And then what happens? The whole world is in chaos because no one is really getting what's best for them. I don't know what's best for me. I never have. I never will. I would need to know the future, all possible options to know what's best for me. I don't know that. So at that moment, all I see is that. And so I'm praying Yes, I'm praying within the litany of my prayers, God, heal little grace in Lord. Would you touch him by your grace? But I'm also saying, Lord, whatever you're going to do in us and in our family, Lord, we prepare our hearts. 
I want to prepare my heart for whatever may happen. And I am not going to curse God and die, as Job's wife said to him. Uh, I will yet praise him, who is the help of my countenance. My soul, why are thou disquieted in God? I will yet praise him. I'm not talking about not grieving. All of the grief is a normal, healthy process. But I have seen people who are grieving years, even decades later, and that is not healthy. To everything is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. There are things that need to last, but then they also need to end. So I wrote this on uh, my uh, post. I, I sent up this uh, the day after. Yesterday, our three-year-old Grayson, grandson Grayson, accidentally fell out of a second-story window of his home. He could have been seriously injured, but God... And then I just began to quote Ephesians 2.4, putting in his name. But God, who is so rich in mercy, loved Grayson so much that even though he could have died, gave him life. He reminded us once again that it is only by God's grace that we've been saved. For the Father, thank you, Father, for having grace on your son. Now, I just thought that was a simple appreciation of love and grace, but got some pushback from a few folks who saw the post and said, you know, um, what about people who lose their child? Did God not love their child? And I wasn't thinking of that. And I did put a like for the comment because it was articulate, uh, their comment. But in my heart, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to praise God no matter what happens. I want to write a post like that if the God forbids happen. And so I'm spending my life preparing for an appropriate response to the heartaches of life. That's what I'm preparing my heart for. Anybody can do well when everything's coming up roses. It's when things are coming up thorns. That's the test. And so you prepare yourself. You know, you prepare yourself. Why do you eat well or exercise? You're preparing yourself not just to look buff, but you're preparing yourself for a day when your body is going to need you to have thought this through. So... I don't want to hurt anyone's feeling that my grandson survived because one day someone may not. And then if you're waiting for me to respond, I may be crying. I may be heartbroken. But the confession that will come out of my mouth, if you cut off my head, my head going across the floor will be trusting God. He will be my God, guide even unto death. Now, that's not, again, that's not heroic. That's just how I want to live because I've lived differently. And that way's better. And I'm, I'm rarely as disappointed as I once was by life because my disappointments have become appointments, have become opportunities for me to see God in the middle of it. That means I'm believing for a move of God in my life, in this church, in this region. If it doesn't happen, I'm going to praise God. I'm believing for 2,000 people to connect the dots in this region that we have a giant opportunity to come together October 25th and see God do something amazing. But if 20 people show up, I'm going to praise God for those 20 people. And my responsibility is to make my heart be just as content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with discontentment is really a shame. And not connecting the dots of what God is doing. Because my response may be the tipping point for the revival. It was on the day before the great move of God took place in Wales, when they had their most sour meeting. It was the night before they had a stinky meeting where nothing happened. And people went home discouraged when nothing's happening. And the next night, the Spirit of God showed up. That's what I'm saying. Preparing my heart for that. If you could come to uh, the keyboard, please. Uh, We're going to receive the Lord's Supper. And we're going to contemplate that. Um, There's more things that I could share about uh, offenses and how they come to this earth. Obviously, Judas was a guy who got offended. He expected Jesus to be king. He expected him to bring his kingdom to earth, even though he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And because of that offense, it led led to a betrayal. If you can get offended with your spouse... And it can lead to a betrayal of your spouse. 
And so I want my heart to be filled. Here's a verse that talks about, let me find, I'll tell you the one I want you to go to. Would you go to, um, Romans 5, 18. And uh, we're going to begin to pass the elements if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, rose from the dead, and he is your Lord and Savior. Then these elements celebrate his life and death. Just hold on to the elements, and then we're going to partake of them together. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, Adam and Eve were offended. As one man's offense... Thank you. Judgment came upon all men. Okay? It was a generational issue. Resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man, that's Jesus, the last Adam, righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Our response to forgive can release someone else from the judgment we've placed on them, but it then also releases us, and I believe has a vicarious benefit to those who are around us, because an unforgiving, bitter person contaminates those around him. And none of us intentionally want to contaminate our kids or grandkids, or loved ones, or co-workers, but we will. And so my appeal to you today, is there an offense in your heart toward anyone? Charles Stanley said, God's mercy is not giving us what we deserve, and his grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Romans 5.20, a couple more slides over. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. When you realize your sin issue was massive, to whom much, to you has been forgiven much, loves much. I wasn't a little sinner. I was a serial sinner. I was a serious sinner. I have been forgiven much in my life. And therefore, my gratitude is grateful, is significant. We're going to wait for the elements to be passed fully, but as I look at this bread, I think about how God came to earth, became a man, took upon himself every temptation that you and I experience and have succumbed to, and he said no to the world, no to the flesh, no to the devil, and he said yes to his father, and because of that, he became a sinless sacrifice. He became the Lamb of God who would be slain from the foundation of the world, prepared to forgive us for our sins. And so, Lord, we, we take the bread that you have given us, Lord, your body that was broken for us. And though our hearts at times have been broken, Lord, you've come to heal our hearts. Even today, your, your word says he sent his word and healed them. But we thank you for coming to this earth living a sinless life, and then allowing your body to be bruised and broken and shredded and hurt for us. We remember today your sacrifice, that you died without bitterness in your heart. You said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You could have sent legions of angels to punish us, but you didn't. Give us that forgiving heart that you had. But we today celebrate your death and resurrection with this element, with this bread. And we are grateful to you. Would you partake of the bread, please? Jesus, as your blood was poured out, your life was in your blood. Your last words, you said, it is finished. Penelestai, you said, not only as my life on this earth finished, but my mission is finished, mission accomplished. I fulfilled the mission of dying for the sins of the world without sin. So Lord, as your blood was shed for us, we celebrate 
your life, celebrate your death, celebrate your resurrection. We toast you today, Lord, remembering your sacrifice for us. Would you partake of the cup, remembering Jesus? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's all stand together. We're just going to just to worship God for a few moments. Let's just allow our, our hearts to be filled with gratitude, with appreciation. If you need to forgive anybody as you worship, just say, God, I forgive them. I release them, Lord. Again, I had to do my father over and over again, even though he was gone. Any bad thought, I release them, Lord. Give me love in my heart for them. Give me love in my heart for whoever it may be.